to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, January 13th, 2014, and here are our top stories. Tonight, China is set to seize an island in the South China Sea by force. Governor Christie's personal tab continues to grow at the taxpayer's expense. And David Knight checks in with Larry Clayman as he continues the fight against the NSA spy network. All this and more on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, there's a lot of talk in the news today about war. And coming out of China, we see in an article from Paul Joseph Watson, China is set to seize a South China Sea island by force. Official Chinese state media had this headline, sudden major move of Chinese troops this year to recover an island by force. Now, this is an island that was taken 40 years ago and has been held ever since by the Philippines. But listen to what they say in the Chinese newspaper. They say, according to experts, the Chinese Navy has drawn a detailed combat plan to seize the island, and the battle will be restricted within the South China Sea. Well, I don't think that's necessarily going to be restricted if they start something like that. And we've seen bizarre and bellicose statements from the Chinese for the last several months from the official Chinese press. As Paul Joseph Watson points out in the story, there's been strident rhetoric about Beijing's ability to attack U.S. military bases in the Western Pacific, as well as a release of a map showing locations of major U.S. cities and how they would be impacted by a nuclear strike launched from the PLA Strategic Submarine Force. And these things are getting people concerned. And so you have to ask yourself, is this just internal saber rattling? Or is this kind of what Joel Skousen has pointed out, that after using the Chinese to take down the U.S. economically, will they try to use China to take, uh, take us down physically with a war? Or is it really something else? It's maybe just a repeat of history. In this article from Washington's blog, they ask, can we avoid the Thucydides trap with China? And they point out that historically, this has happened. Countries start wars to distract their population from lousy economies. Currency and trade wars end up turning into shooting wars. And this is pointed out by the New York Times back in 2011. They point out that the Peloponnesian War was made inevitable because of the growth of Athenian power and the fear that it caused in Sparta. As they say, history doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly does rhyme. Now there's rumors of war coming from another area as well. It's not just a question of whether or not the Chinese, after we built them up economically, after we transferred military secrets to them, will they be the ones to attack America? Will they be the ones that the globalists use to attack us? Or will it be Al-Qaeda that we created, that we funded, that we trained? And now this is what we see happening today. We've got neocons calling for U.S. military action against Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And this is what they have to say. I'm not saying that we ought to have American troops in thousands of numbers back there, but the withdrawal that occurred in December of 2011 brought this about. The end result of the failure of this administration in Iraq is a symbol of what's to come in Afghanistan if we turn tail and run from there just like we did in December 11 in Iraq. Well, there you go. It's the usual suspects, again, promoting endless war. You know, every time the government fails, they just use that as an excuse to do more of what caused the failure. Now, Kurt Nemo has an excellent article where he breaks down the revolving door and the nepotism between these different neocon think tanks. It's worth a read. Now, there's not just going to be war abroad, perhaps, but perhaps at home as well. That's what we're concerned about when we see the military buildup within our police force. And now we have a future cop attacking Copwatch and says that protesters should be exterminated in gas chambers. You know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that's exactly what we see from this fellow, who is Darren Redding, a former U.S. Marine and a current cadet in training with the Washoe County Sheriff's Police Department. He said, if I had my way, there would be another Holocaust with camps and gas chambers full of effing scabs like you. I hope you die. I hope some cop beats your ass next time you're protesting or filming them or whatever. In fact, I'm about to start the training academy for the Washoe County Sheriff's Department in Reno, Nevada, and I can't wait to deal with punk-ass bitches like you. I would beat your effing ass just for the sheer joy of it. Yeah, we've seen a lot of cops doing that just for the sheer joy of it. And we see that the police never do anything to rein them in. They need to punish these cops just like they would if they weren't wearing a uniform. A crime is a crime. When they shoot fleeing suspects, when they lift up a dog and push it into the door of a stopped car when the guy's got his hands up, those people need to go to jail. 
for those kinds of actions. And yet we see the police departments and the police unions protecting them, giving them paid leave. And even when there's a successful lawsuit, it's the taxpayers that pay the burden of that. That needs to be taken care of out of the police department's budget. They need to lose some of these people who have this kind of attitude. Where did he get that attitude? Where did he get that heart? Well, he's a former Marine, and we're seeing a lot of very dark information about what the military is training people as to who their enemies are. We are not the enemies. The American public is not the enemy of the police, like the government is trying to pretend that's the case. But there's other ways that the police can be corrupted. We see out of England another report from the Independent. Now, this is amazing because I find it amazing that they're actually talking about this openly in the mainstream media, but it's kind of hard to ignore. We have good police and we have good media that are revealing this because they're actually tired of seeing the corruption and the cover-ups that are going on. There's been two studies out of England, and both of these studies, one of them is Operation Tiberius, written in 2002. Another one was Project Riverside in 2008. And what they're finding is, is that gangs are using the Freemasons to corrupt the police. In Operation Tiberius, written in 2002, it found that underworld syndicates use their contacts in the controversial brotherhood, the Freemasons, to recruit corrupted officers. Now, Scotland Yard says that this is the most difficult aspects of organized crime to protect against. It's also the most difficult one to expose. And the article here says the political establishment and much of the media often dismisses such ideas as the work of conspiracy theorists. And yet, these are investigations, two major operations and investigations conducted in England, as well as, look at this, back in 1998, Home Secretary Jack Straw was concerned over the influence of Freemasons on the criminal justice system, and he tried to order that all police officers and judges should declare whether or not they were members of the Freemasons. And of course, that was blocked by about a quarter of the police departments there who refused to abide by that law. Now, there's another investigation that's coming out about Chris Christie, and this looks to be even more incriminating than the bridge shutdown, bridge gate, or I guess you could call it the Bridget gate. Uh, this is about misuse of funds in the aftermath of the Sandy hurricane. It says, just days after dismissing two advisors, Chris Christie faced questions over the use of Superstorm Sandy relief funds. They find out that he gave money to produce tourism ads that starred him and his family, and he even gave it to a higher bidder. The winning bid of $4.7 million featured Christie and his family in the ads, while the losing $2.5 million proposal did not feature the Christie's. So here you go, the people are paying 88% more to enhance Chris Christie's political image. But I don't think this is gonna enhance his image. Now, as we're being distracted by things like the Chris Christie scandal, and it's not just a distraction, it's a real concern when we see that kind of arrogance and corruption, but there's something far more serious going on, and that is under the radar, Congress is moving to push the Trans-Pacific Partnership and TAFTA. We see that Max Baucus and Orrin Hatch have put out a bipartisan act, they call it the Trade Priorities Act of 2014. Now what this is going to do is, this is going to excuse them from having a constitutional vote on a trade treaty. We should be very concerned about this. Congress cannot just exempt itself from following the Constitution. The Constitution says that they have to have a two-thirds vote of the Senate. But then they come around and they pass this act which says, and of course Senator Baca says, we're introducing this today to make sure we get these trade deals done and get them done right. Well, here's what they're going to do to you, as pointed out by a group opposing this called Fight for the Future. They're going to restrict police and censor the internet. They're going to stifle free speech and innovation. They're going to radically decrease access to affordable medicine. They're going to prevent corporations from properly labeling GMO food. And they're going to elevate individual foreign firms to the equal status of sovereign nations. Well, this is the most egregious threat to both our rights and our money that we have ever seen. And our elected representatives, who are not allowed to see the bill, are supposed to vote on it without any amendments in a simple majority instead of the two-thirds approval required by the Constitution for a treaty. Now, right after the break, we're going to be joining Jakari Jackson. He's in California taking radiation readings and getting the public's reactions. Stay tuned.
My friends, Alex Jones here to tell you about some of the most important information concerning you and your family's health. Radiation levels have more than doubled in the last 60 years in the Northern Hemisphere from all of the nuclear testing and radiological accidents. Radioactive contamination is now in most of the food supply. There's only two ways to avoid this. Move south of the equator or properly protect your thyroid with nascent iodine. Looking to protect my family, I've done deep research. Nascent iodine is the purest, cleanest, absolute best form of iodine to protect yourself and your family. It's made right here in the USA, completely non-GMO. I searched out the best quality and now have developed a double strength form of nascent iodine exclusively available at InfoWarsLife.com. Nascent iodine is on record as one of the only safe ways to detox from fluoride poisoning. Survival Shield Nascent Iodine. Secure your super high quality nascent iodine today at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com. Introducing Pro One. All of your filtration in one system, portable, on the go. No more do you have two or three filters to just reduce sodium fluoride. You have a system that cuts out the sodium fluoride and up to 95% of hydrofluorosilicic acid. Advanced manufacturing technology combines silver impregnated white ceramic with new Aquamedics advanced media for removal of fluoride and other heavy metals, all in one filter element. It is the only one that does it and out of the gate. We have it discounted at 10% off with promo code WATER. This is the only system that in one unit helps reduce or remove pesticides, herbicides, chloramines, ammonia and chlorine, hydrofluorosilicic acid, the most common form of fluoride not covered by other fluoride filter brands, and sodium hexafluorosilicate. Get your Pro Pure with a new Pro One filter today at InfoWarsStore.com or by calling 888-253-3139. We've sent the InfoWars crew out to California because we've had a lot of reports of unusual things. We've seen a lot of sea life dying off in unusual quantities, unusual ways. We've also seen even debris with Japanese writing on it. And we were told when Fukushima happened that we could expect to see radioactive debris, perhaps even some radioactive activity coming across on the currents right about now. And we've also seen unusual activity on part of the government in terms of stockpiling radiation protection in the form of potassium iodide in massive dosages of 14 million doses that they want in just a couple of weeks. So the InfoWars crew is there, and we're going to ask them what they're seeing in California. Welcome, Jakari. Tell us what you're doing and where you are. Well, David, we're right outside the Golden Gate Bridge, and we just shot a man on the street a few moments ago. And David, I'll tell you that I was a bit discouraged because we went to Half Moon Bay. We found many awake, alive, vibrant people, but we came here, and nobody really cares about anything. We did find some awake people, but, you know, you walk up to somebody, he says, I don't want to be filmed on camera. Then I took the moment to educate the gentleman <laughs> that he was being filmed by the NSA. He's being filmed <laughs> by these streetlights over here, but he doesn't care about that. I guess he's more concerned with the 49ers, but we did find some people who actually care about this information about the bioaccumulation that's going on in Half Moon Bay, the excessive levels of radiation. Well, you know, Jakari, what you're describing there is really kind of like a double think. You know, this guy's all concerned about you putting a camera in his face, but he doesn't think about the dozens of cameras pointed at him at any given time. And I see the same thing in terms of radiation. People are looking at 1,400% increases, 1,000% increases, and they say, well, you know, don't worry, it's only 5, 10, 14 times what we're normally seeing, but that's normal. No, it's 5 to 10 to 14 times normal. But there's this kind of, they can hold that uh, that, that conflicting, cognitively dissonant thing in their head at the same time, just like something out of uh, George Orwell. Yeah, just like you said, David, as long as it's not in their face, as long as it's not their kids getting sick or the lady who told us her friend was going bald, as long as it's not their friend, as long as it's not somebody they know, they just don't care about this information. They're more concerned with the 49ers going to the championship game or whatever else the situation may be. But there are awake people out here, and I am happy to see that. You know, it's one of these things, when you get a, a lower level of exposure to radiation, there's a certain probability, there's a stochastic risk, a statistical risk that you won't come down with it. Not everybody in Hiroshima and Nagasaki died, but there's an increasing risk as it accumulates in you over a period of time. And it's something that you can't really quantify for yourself individually. You don't know if you're genetically predisposed to it. You don't even know the level of risk that you're getting. But it's easy for people to say, well, there's always a finite chance. No matter how small, this isn't going to affect me negatively in my health 
so they just ignore it. Well, just you touched on it right there, David, because they say, well, this is normal for this level, this, these normal levels of radiation. Well, just because something is normal doesn't mean that it's necessarily good.